How to buy real estate on the fringes. That's today's show. When you're done watching today's show, you're gonna know why we invest for cash flow and where to find those great deals. Hey everyone, welcome to the Investing in Real Estate show. I'm Clayton Morris, longtime real estate investor. And in 2017, I left my day job in order to focus on financial freedom and passive income exclusively. Now, our goal with this show is to try to help you build financial intelligence, to help you perhaps get out of the rat race, leave the nine to five job, and also seek financial freedom. Now, we're all about passive income. The vehicle that we use is buy and hold real estate, but frankly, I don't care how you do it. You could buy gold, you could buy Bitcoin, Whatever vehicle you use, that's great. We use buy and hold real estate. I'm super excited to announce our guest on today's show. Our guest today is Ben Mises. He, he's a really interesting story. He created the Clever Real Estate Network, which is a, nation, a nationwide referral brokerage that lets consumers list their homes for, for a flat fee which is kind of amazing because if you think about how all of the back and forth and sort of the sharks in this business, his company lets you do it for a flat fee and put your property out there. He's also a big time real estate investor and he is in the St. Louis area. And today we're going to talk about buying properties on the fringes, which is part of his strategy. Ben, welcome to the show. Clayton, thanks for having me and I'm looking forward to being here. Well, super great to have you on here, Ben. So give us, uh, give our viewers a little background um, on how you got started in real estate investing and did the brokerage come first? Was it a chicken or the egg thing? How did it, how'd you get started? So I got into the game as an investor first. I was actually uh, working at a different startup. It was my job to build a platform that was uh, helping invitation homes and some of the bigger players in the industry buy and sell single family rentals. And before they assigned that to me, they said, you need to learn everything about real estate investing so you can understand this platform. So I got on bigger pockets. I started learning, started researching. And pretty quickly, I looked outside in my backyard and saw the numbers I could get here in St. Louis were incredible as an investor. So about two months after that, I was under contract for my uh, first four, fourplex. And I guess about a year and a half after that, we have uh, 22 doors and we're uh, currently looking to add another 20 or 40 here in the next year. Oh, that's great. Impressive. Impressive. So how, what was the time frame on how all that unfolded? So I went under contract uh, about two months after I decided to get educated on my first fourplex. Uh, three months after that, we were under contract for our first big renovation. We did uh, about $150,000 renovation on a $400,000 building. And during the process of doing that, while we were turning out the units, we actually uh, sold the first building only because we wanted to use that capital to buy 18 units all at once so we could scale up our portfolio. And we bought uh, 16 units on the fringe and uh, two units in a pretty decent area in that package. Great. So now when you say we, who, who is we You're working with a couple of partners on this? Um, I have one partner that I invest with who uh, is also a partner at the uh, tech company we started together as well. Great. All right. So we're going to get into buying on the fringes in just a moment, but tell me about the brokerage that you guys created. How did, how did that idea come to you? Yeah. One of the things when I was, uh, I'm very data driven when it comes to my investing. So we were constantly modeling out deals, modeling out the price to buy them, the price to sell them. And it really became apparent that commissions can sometimes make it difficult to really find a deal that hits our underwriting model. Right. And then speaking to others, you know, more individual homeowners, I would kind of find that everyone still needs a professional agent to help them, but they don't always want to pay that full commission, especially if you know it's easier than it ever was to market a home with the advent of the internet. So there isn't the need for the full commission, but they still do need that great service. So we've built a network of about 1500 agents across the country who will list your home for either a flat fee of 3000 or 1% if it's more than 350,000. And they still provide the same full service and expertise you need to really do a great job of buying or selling a home. I was just about to ask, so is it sort of a wholesale, you don't get all the bells and whistles that you might get from listing it somewhere else, but you guys, you guys have addressed that. How do you handle that scale? So the thing that we do is we can approach an agent and say, you know, you're not going to make as much commission as you would on this deal, but if you do a great job and our sellers are happy, we'll send you more business. So they're willing to kind of still provide that full service because we're sending them the volume to make it worth it. We have uh, agents in some markets that are doing 10 deals a month with us. So, you know, that's $30,000 of revenue for them. So it really starts to add up and they're excited and really thrilled to work with the sellers that we send them. That's great. That's great. All right, let's dive into today's topic, which is buying properties on the fringes. That's my favorite thing to do. So you and I are right yeah. in alignment with that. Um, how did you, you know, how did you come to this philosophy 
on buying on the fringes? Did you start out knowing that, hey, you know, you've got to find deals, you've got to try to add value, or was your sort of natural inclination to kind of lean towards the ones that are more overpriced? All the work has already been done. You're buying it on the market. Maybe you're just going on Zillow.com and you're finding properties which are going to be overpriced. How did you come to this? So I got started my first property. I knew I wanted to live there, so it had to be in an area that I was comfortable comfortable living in. My only goal was to buy a four-family home where the three other tenants could pay for my rent in an area I wanted to live in. So I started out just modeling every deal in an area I was comfortable living in until I ended up finding a really good deal that I purchased. And from managing that first deal, you know, living with my tenants and kind of becoming comfortable with being a landlord, then I was able to kind of free up my thoughts and think, what is the best way to do this more as a way to achieve financial freedom? And the market is decently hot in St. Louis, so a lot of the areas you're really just buying for appreciation. So I started looking kind of, where can I get the cash flow I need to make this worth my time and let me hit that financial freedom? But once we do that, where can I buy that also has the chance for appreciation? And I kind of modeled out every different neighborhood and really settled on the fringe just by kind of figuring out what would set me up for the financial freedom that I really needed, but also the best chance for appreciation to build tremendous wealth down in the long term. So that's exactly how I buy as well in those fringe areas that uh, you know if you that if you you can ride that wave a little bit you will see some appreciation but again that's not why I buy so now to be clear that appreciation is nice icing on the cake but that's not why you buy right yeah we're buying strictly for cash flow because we aim for about a fifteen to twenty percent uh, cash on cash return which is really makes it worth the time to kind of find these deals and go through the underwriting process. Right. So you're looking at, and you're a multifamily investor, so you're buying larger multifamily units, correct? Yeah. I thought about getting into single family, but it's really tough, especially running a company where if I can buy, you know, a package or at least a four family building where just doing the work of one purchase, I can walk away with four doors. Definitely makes it uh, easier with a busy schedule to scale a portfolio. Yeah, that's true. That is true. You just have to be able to find those those right deals. And because you live in that area where you're able to do some of that on the ground legwork and modeling some of these neighborhoods, it makes it uh, it makes it more interesting. We've had a number of a number of multifamily investors on the show recently who aren't really buying anything right now because yeah. they're saying how difficult it is to find deals. Ken McElroy and others who they're seeing stuff with like a three percent return and they're just they're, 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 in fact, they're selling a lot of their multifamily stuff right now, and they're just kind of waiting. Um, where, what are you seeing? I mean, I guess maybe St. Louis might be a little different. What are you seeing right now? Unfortunately, I am actually in that camp. We were really excited. We refinanced the, uh, the big rehab we did. Uh, we got a lot of cash out of it, and we've been just looking for a place to put it that kind of meets our underwriting goals. And unfortunately, we haven't been able to find it either. So we're currently on the sidelines looking for something that kind of fits our goals. And we really don't want to just get excited and jump into a bad deal. So we're really waiting and analyzing until we find something that makes sense. Yeah. Come over to my side of the uh, the lake because uh, single family right now, it's one of the hot areas. So uh, we're, we're happy to welcome you in, Ben, into, uh, into that. But I think that speaks to something really smart, which is you're not getting shiny object syndrome, which is your model, what you've bought and you've been successful with is multifamily. Mm -hmm. What I have bought and been successful with is single family. And so I don't go into the larger multifamily stuff because to me, unless, you know, and I might down the line, but to me, it's a distraction because I know what I'm good at. Like, you know what you're good at. So you're fine right now yeah. in this shifting economy, kind of sitting back and waiting and then being able to pounce on the right deal when it comes, right? Yeah, and I will say the single family model, I've definitely seen it work for, you know, the guys who are buying billions of dollars. I've seen it make small investors tons and tons of money, and I'm sure it uh, sounds like it's making your investors a ton of money as well. So it's uh, a great avenue, really. Real estate, whatever the avenue, if you're buying right. cash flow correctly, is, is really an incredible way to do it. Absolutely. Self-storage, billboards. That's why I say at the beginning of the show, you know, buy and hold real estate is the vehicle that we use, but you can you can build passive income any way you want, and you can get into the mechanics of it, multifamily, you know, mobile home parks. It doesn't matter to me. Just pick a strategy and then stick with it. But but Ben, I want to kind of dive in a little bit more of the details of this buying on the fringes. Um, when you were modeling these different neighborhoods, what specifically are you looking for in the neighborhoods where you're going to be buying that you know you can see maybe a little appreciation over time, but you're going to be able to add value to those properties and you're going to be able to get that cash flow that you're looking for? 
Yeah, so it, it really starts with the thesis. So in St. Louis, there's the street that's called uh, Cherokee Street, and it's seen a ton of uh, urban revitalization. There's concert venues, there's bars, um, there's a lot of ethnic foods, and people more and more are going down there and it's become a destination. So that street has become a bit more expensive. But if you expand outwards, there's neighborhoods that are still pretty rough. You can buy 2% deals or better. So it, on the surface, it seems like a, a good shot. And then what we do to really prove out our thesis is we'll actually drive the neighborhoods and you'll kind of look for signs of changes. So we, I know in the area we bought, there's a brand new coffee shop, a couple restaurants are sprouting up. And that kind of, if you walk the neighborhood and you feel like there's signs of change, that's definitely a good sign. And then we'll look at the hard numbers. We'll take a look at all of the rents in the area, see where they are trending to other areas. We saw them creeping up just a little bit. And then the last thing we really recommend is we'll actually check the building permits in the area. And the area we bought, I think it's a 500% increase in renovation permits in the last 12 months. So we got in right at the start of that. And it's still not a lot compared to other areas in St. Louis, but it's a lot compared to where it was historically. So we're starting to see the first kind of uh, the entrance of investors who are doing some renovations, you know, making the rentals nicer, starting some single family home conversions. So the neighborhood is just starting to turn. So we don't know if it's going to continue, but it's good enough to make a bet, especially because we're just buying it for cash flow. That's great. And why St. Louis? Because you know it, you're there, you live in it. Yeah, it's, um, I definitely like investing in areas that I know because it definitely gives me some peace of mind. I can go drive and look at my properties. And I'm also fortunate that St. Louis is an incredible tertiary market for buying cash flow and for doing this strategy. You know, if I lived in a different city, if I was in a San Francisco, I would absolutely be looking around the country to invest out of state. So right. I'm really fortunate. I believe uh, you invest in predominantly Indianapolis. I'm in Indianapolis. I'm in Michigan. I'm doing some stuff in Texas as well. I own in Pennsylvania and some other states. Um, but you're right. You know, I live in a very expensive part of the country and I have to always say to people, it's a mantra that we have here on the show, which is, you know, the best properties are not in your backyard unless you happen to live in one of those great areas where the properties yeah. are in your backyard. And you're a perfect example of, uh, yeah. of opportunities in St. Louis. Indianapolis is really similar from what I've seen from kind of a mm -hmm. cash flow standpoint. So yeah, very similar. And so these Midwest markets are very interesting because I think and I, you and I can talk about this a little bit more, which is I like to buy where Americans, you know, Americans love getting their Amazon boxes delivered to them, you know. And so you and I invest in areas where there's these big distribution centers and American based jobs of FedEx distribution hubs and UPS distribution hubs and those types of places. Those aren't going to China because they need to deliver me my Amazon box. Right. So they're here locally. Yeah. And St. Louis has a lot of that. Right. We do. We have a couple of new kind of distribution facilities going in. We have um, not as much of that, but it's definitely enough that you can kind of see these areas, there's always going to be a demand for these kind of uh, affordable working housing. So it's a great place to get in and kind of buy it correctly. Yeah, we just saw data this past week about this country is becoming a renter nation. Um, yeah. I mean, we're seeing interest rates probably going to go up another two times this year. The Fed is indicating they're probably going to raise rates again. It's still difficult to get a mortgage. And I mean, do you have trouble getting your properties rented right now? I mean, it seems like renters are clamoring for properties and rental rates are going up and up. Yeah, so we've seen, I only have experience, we do uh, affordable housing and we've done some high-end stuff, but nothing on the, the, the ultra end of luxury. But we've seen the affordable housing, we rent them for about six fifty a door. They are flying off the shelves. We'll list them, we know, we'll have 10 or 12 showings scheduled in the first week. And we've seen our units that rent for about 900 to 1200 have similar results. And the only ones that have been a bit slow were the $1,500 more the nicer units with granite countertops. If we rent them in leasing season when they're students, they'll move quickly. But if we put them in the winter, they'll be slow. But most of the affordable housing and that kind of uh, the working class housing is flying off the shelves to lease. Right. And job, John Shaw writes about this in his great book, you know, how to become a millionaire investor one house at a time. And he says, this is why he targets these exact same types of properties, right? The affordable housing where you have, I, I just did a video recently on this exact subject called there are three types of tenants, right? You have those that can't afford to live in your properties. Well, we don't work with those people because then you're going to have vacancies all the time. And then you have people that are kind of just right, right in the middle. You know, they don't have enough really to buy the house and they don't necessarily want to 
to, but they do make a good solid blue collar income that they can live in your house. And then you have the sort of luxury A-class doctor tenant, which is never going to stay in your property for very long. They're going to be there yeah. maybe for six months and then move out. So we always try to go right for that middle, that middle tenant, right? Agreed. And it definitely, uh, I've kind of enjoyed the aspect. We had kind of try and buy from uh, bad landlords who've neglected their buildings. And it's really kind of emotionally rewarding to buy a building. We usually do new roofs, we'll tuck point, we'll redo the sewers, and you can provide a great place for these people to call home and do it profitably. It's definitely uh, why I also like being in that middle of the market segment where you can really add value both to the people renting from you and to your bottom line. Right. Yeah. To be able to transform a neighborhood is, uh, is it's wonderful. It's wonderful. So what's next for you? Where are you going to take your portfolio? What are you looking to do? I know with the multifamily space right now, harder and harder to buy something. So what are you going to do? Are you going to wait till 2019, 2020? So we're still actively looking. We're definitely trying to go off market since a lot of the deals we're seeing that come on, everyone seems to be seeing kind of how much can I sell my property for? So it's not a great time to buy. But with the amount of work I'm doing on my day job, it definitely limits the amount of time we have to buy. So we have a really strict buy box. We're looking for uh, two bedroom units, ideally a 12 plex or bigger to really make it worth the time. So there's not that many of them. So we're potentially even interested in looking out of state if the opportunity arises. Wonderful. Well, Ben, it's been great having you here on the show. I love talking about this uh, stuff with like-minded investors who are doing things, different deals in different parts of the country. And so buying properties on the fringes, I hope my audience paid attention to that. And how can people check out your, you know, if someone has a property they want to list and they want to do it for a flat fee, how can people connect with your company? Yeah, we're Clever Real Estate and you can find us at uh, listwithclever.com or you can um, send me an email directly. I'm Ben at Move With Clever, and I write about uh, financial freedom financial freedom on uh, medium.com at uh, Ben Mises. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much, Ben. I really appreciate you joining us today. Thanks so much for sharing your knowledge. Thanks for having me on. I really appreciated it. You bet. And thanks to all of you at home for downloading and subscribing. We publish the show multiple times per week. If you're not already a subscriber, please subscribe. And also you should check out some of the other great content that we have here. We have it available right now for you to go and check out so you can increase your financial intelligence and take your investing to the next level. We'll be back here again with another episode. Until then, go out there, take action, become a real estate investor. I believe it's the number one way to build wealth. And remember, buy properties on the fringes, like Ben said. We'll see you next time, everyone.